so uh, that is what the uh, faculty of the medical school uh, decided as well. And so they set up a, um, a special admission program uh, to try to uh, have a more diverse student body. And they, they expanded the student body from 50 to 100. And they set aside 16 of the 100 places to uh, people from designated minority groups, which were blacks, Chicanos, Asians, and American Indians. Um, so, is that then constitutional law? Is that a good response to the problem? Well, the court said it wasn't a good response and that it wouldn't be constitutional. The court said it wasn't constitutional. It was not because... Um, it seemed like here they were hinging a lot on... Um, Reserving this number of spots, I mean, basically gives equal opportunity, but at the expense of others that may not necessarily need to be punished for this policy. Okay, so the the program is challenged by by Alan Baki, uh, who, who's here in the picture, and. Um, he argued that he would have gotten in um, if this program had not existed. Now, 2,000 or so people applied for these 100 positions. So one interesting question, and, and uh, uh, just to keep in mind, because we'll, we'll get to standing uh, later on in the semester, is whether uh, Mr. Baki has standing to, to bring this claim. because. Can he realistically uh, argue that he would have been the one to get in if this special admission program had not existed? Um, he would have had a, a bit more of a chance, but still, 16 out of 2,000, the odds would have been against him in the nature of things. So can he prove injury? Um, he can't really prove that he would have gotten in, so the injury has to be the injury of not being considered within this group of 16. Um, and is that a sufficient injury to uh, get him into federal court? Uh, in any event, that's uh, an issue we'll, we'll talk about more later on. So, um, so he, he's arguing that this is, uh, that, that by excluding him, by having a program that he's excluded from, uh, he's denied equal protection. Uh, so, what, what's, what's the, uh, what's the holding, uh, Rob, of the, of the case? Um, well, it was, a uh, it was, the thought before, it was, four, it was a 4 4 split, and then Al had a, um, a joining opinion, which was an opinion with, uh, finding against the policy. Um, but essentially what they said was, um, what the four that were, I suppose, in favor of upholding the decision was that they wanted to, um, they, they applied an immediate, the intermediate scrutiny test to it, saying that if the, uh, if the overriding policy question of that um, affirmative action was, if they could prove that it was important and, um, It was an important and articulated purpose, um, then it would be valid. But the uh, the four, uh, I, I think they call it the, the burger four, um, essentially they feel like that violates the title six of the equal protection policy. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as Rob has explained, it was a 4 to 4 split with Justice Powell uh, writing the uh, uh, deciding opinion, and he uh, has some 
support for each side, but uh, his conclusion is that the, the program is unconstitutional because it's exclusive, not, not because it, it uh, looks at race, but because it, it's an uh, exclusive program and, and therefore not the least drastic way of reaching the goal. So, um, as, as Rob said, four justices led by uh, Justice Brennan argued that we should not use strict scrutiny in this situation because uh, we shouldn't be suspicious of this kind of a categorization because basically it's white people uh, putting together a program that, that burdens white people. And um, if, if it's white people burdening non-white people, then we should be suspicious. But if it's white people burdening white people, then we should assume that they're doing it because of some overriding important reason, and we should uh, still maybe look at it a little bit more closely than we would look at some other categories, but we, we would use intermediate scrutiny, and so under in intermediate scrutiny, and we'll see this in different contexts, you, instead of looking for a compelling interest, you look for an important interest, and instead of having to come up with at least a drastic alternative, you simply have to show that the program is substantially related to the goal you're trying to achieve. So it's a less rigorous um, form of scrutiny. And uh, Rob, is that, is that a sensible approach? Um, I think you have concerns on either side. Um, I think if you're thinking about it in terms of the Equal Protection Clause, I think one of the notes discussed whether or not, um, if you go back to footnote four of the Caroline Products, we think you know, whether or not whites can constitute a um, discrete and insular uh, uh, cat uh, class of people, or whether or not, because of their historical um, kind of position, whether or not that would um, affect the way that we classify them. Okay, and we'll talk about the Caroline Products case more tomorrow when we look at uh, the rational basis and more, um, more attention. Um, but obviously white people aren't insular because we're not isolated, we're everywhere, right? We're the majority race. Uh, so we're not marginalized, we're not excluded from power or opportunities, we, we basically run the place, don't we? So, so you can't put us in the discrete and insular category, and therefore, if white people are burdened, Brennan says, it's not up to the court to, uh, to protect them, because white people can go to the legislature and change the rule. We have the political clout. And the court should only protect those groups that don't have the political clout. And the court should otherwise defer to the legislative decision. So, um, Lily, what, what do you think? Would you join Justice Brennan, or? or no? um, I don't know. I think Nine racial classification. So I think that it's the purpose was something that was rational, it was to uphold diversity. So I think that that's a rational basis and there's an informed governmental purpose. And by holding those seats, you're serving that purpose. Okay, he, uh, so, so Brian is saying we have invidious classifications and then we have benign classifications. And we can tell the difference. We can tell when something is done to be hurtful and when something is done to, to protect uh, disadvantaged classes. Not that difficult to figure out what's going on here. The purpose here wasn't to hurt white people. White people still got the bulk of the slots in this medical school. The purpose was to, to help those uh, disadvantaged groups. And in the process, you're also helping the white people because the white people who are studying with doctors are going to have non-whites in their classrooms. And is, it, is that a good thing? I think so. Yeah? Do you, you think non-whites should have some, I mean, white people should have some non-whites around to? So I think that like, in the workplace, you're going to work around such diverse people. Because, so your education should reflect the diversity of society at large. Okay. So, Christopher, do you agree that, that white people benefit by having non-whites in the classroom? Absolutely. 
because I think that's that's a rather good point. It's the government's job to educate educate citizens in preparation for something, not for the pur not not simply for purposes of education alone. I mean, whether or not diversity helps the classroom experience is is it depends on on that particular classroom experience in a science lab that that might not be so helpful when only quantitative analysis is being undertaken, whereas in a law a law school classroom or social sciences, quantitative analysis should be undertaken from various perspectives. Um, nevertheless, in the professional world, uh, what education is trying to prepare us for, uh, it's a mixture oftentimes between the two, um, and qualitative analysis often comes into uh, a high level of importance in decision making. So yeah, I think that, I think that undertaking diverse experiences in education or being forced to undertake diverse experience in education by the government is, is a good enough purpose, a good enough governmental purpose for um, for them to compel benign racial classifications such as this. Okay, so doctors and lawyers, for the most part, are going to be dealing with people. And uh, if you're being a doctor or a lawyer in California, you're going to be dealing with people of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. So being able to have those human skills to, to deal with them is an important part of being a doctor or a lawyer. And, uh, so the, the law school or medical school uh, should, uh, among other things, uh, help people understand the diverse community that they're, that they're living in. Um, and if, if uh, having a, a set-aside program is a good way to do that, Christopher, then is it constitutional to do it? I don't think that it's constitutional, no. Um, Okay. I, I don't. I even don't know. It's a good thing, even though. Um, even though it's a good thing, even though it's it's socially positive. Um, why isn't it? Why is it not constitutional? Uh, because I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't believe in the benign versus insidious racial classification uh, distinction that's made by Brennan. I, I think that it's um, that the the Constitution doesn't include any such language, and and that um, racial classifications. Are prima facie not allowed unless unless they meet the strict scrutiny test. Okay, but, but why do you how do you get to that if uh, the the burden is on white people and um, white people made the rule burdening themselves? Um, why I, should the court play a particular role in that kind of situation? Um, because. Uh, I mean, yeah, under, under a separations of powers kind of analysis, the legislature should theoretically be enabled to do as they will, um, but the Constitution does set some baselines, and, and I think the slippery slope... Well, all the Constitution says is equal protection. Right, so the, the, the courts are going so to have to... How do we get from equal protection to strict scrutiny? Um, by the means that equal protection does have the word equal in it. It's a quantitative... <laughs> measure that has to hold across time and space. Okay, so your interpretation of equal means um, color blindness. That's right. I don't know what they actually disagree with what they did. And I have to be able to explain the rationale for this. And for me, what they say is basically like, or at least like what he's saying, to me, seems basically like putting two people on the track and like letting one person run ahead of the other person and letting the other person start. Because you're saying that the white people are starting on the track ahead of the non-white people? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and then you're saying you're giving them equal opportunity, but I think the idea of equal opportunity between two people who are getting on the track at different points in time is just that doesn't make sense. Okay, so uh, just just elaborate a little bit more on uh, the it disadvantage. Not elaborate. I wasn't prepared to. <laughs> Um, what the, the disadvantage is here that we're trying to overcome. 